When I'm asked to what comes first, character or plot, I always say I cannot separate these two out. The number of times for me, uh, a situation, a moment in a plot, a collision of fates generates a character, a whole new character. Uh, I can't even count them up. And the reverse is also the case. Um, basically, the two are so interlinked. So often characters arise out of plots, often plots drive characters into existence. And for me, that's exactly how it is. Uh, circumstances make the character and the characters generate possibilities. That sense of possibility is always so important. So characters can create their own waves. Um, so for me, it's impossible to disentangle. They are their own fates, characters, and uh, they generate their fates, but they're also, like us, products of not history, but um, plot. Well, I think that Lessons is indeed the closest I've been to my own life. Um, partly the circumstances I was writing it in, lockdown, um, entering into my 70s, beginning to take a look back at my own existence, a, a wonderfully empty diary. So uh, what I was doing now was exactly what I'd be doing in four weeks' time. I've got very little patience for reading memoirs. Uh, so given that I tend to write the kinds of books I'd like to read, and read the kind of books I'd like to write, actually it works both ways, uh, I've always skipped more in the direction of invention. Inevitably, I mean, the novel is a very personal form anyway. Bits of you just come off. You know, your, f your fingerprints are going to be all over whatever you do. People who know me well, uh, family, for example, will, can always connect what I'm writing, inventing with things in my life. But here in Lessons, I really wanted to dramatize in fictional form, not necessarily always staying directly close um, in the way that I would have to in a biography. But I wanted to get the emotional truth of certain rather sad, tragic, disturbing things that happened in my family, withheld information, um, lives that were really full of dismay and regret. Uh, I wanted to get that down on the page, but without having to go through the grind of this year, that year, this year, that year, you know, from then until now. And the reflective element was also a movement towards trying to understand the circumstances, uh, not only of my life, but my generation's life. And of course, as I move through time, other readers of slightly younger generations you can join in the throng and and find something familiar for themselves. Who best to describe a life, a biographer or uh, an autobiographist? Uh, is a very good question. Um, I would guess, I mean, I, I, I read a lot of autobiography. Um, and find myself restless with the form, as I've said already. Um, biography in general, I think, is a wonderful life writing in that sense is a, an extraordinary art. And some close friends of mine are very good biographers. And if you really want to zero in on a life, I think what you need is about five or six biographies written over a hundred years. Because as we know, with the big writers, Lawrence, let's say, Joyce, uh, usually for each generation, there is one great big work and no one can step around it. Then as time passes, our own values change, our own sense of what's important shifts and it needs another generation's great biographer. And that's why I think you, you, biographers also need their, biographies also need their lives um, seen from different points of view. And I'd say if you want to know everything uh, it's possible to know about a great poet, um, you'll need to read three or four biographies written over maybe a century or two centuries. I read a lot of fiction. I enjoy a lot of fiction. Does it change me? Does it influence me? No, it's too late. It's, I mean, I kind of found my way forward a long time ago. 
except in the most general way that all of life shapes you and and so on. But yeah, there are, uh, I mean, I think if we can talk in the most uh, general terms about character in fiction, it took the whole of the 19th century to work out how to do this. I mean, we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. If I can um, steal from Isaac Newton, we have very little sense of how to generate on the page an open-ended character um, until we had, I think, the writing of Jane Austen and then later Flaubert, and then right through the century, through the great Russian writers um, and, and so on. They taught us how to write characters um, as if they were real people. They don't stand for virtue or vice, which was often the case with, with a lot of world literature up until that point, with one or two exceptions. Then came, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, a great artistic revolution. And again, I think we all stand on the shoulders of the great modernists like Joyce, especially Joyce, I think, who taught us to understand characters from the flow of consciousness, right from the very inside, which I don't think the 19th century got. They were placing them beautifully within a social context. So uh, if you ask me, then Madame Bovary, um, Dorothea in Middlemarch, uh, yes, uh, Elizabeth Bennet in Jane Austen, yes, they've, they've all, I've, in I've internalized them, they've become real. But Stephen Dedalus, for me, still is the shining example of someone created from the inside. In that story, there is one great, extraordinary exception, and I think that's Hamlet. Up until the early 17th century, no one could create a character full of doubt. And that's why I think Hamlet is our first modern character. Someone who doubts himself, doubts the world around him. A kind of agnostic or a skeptic. Um, maybe uh, you could search around in world literature and there are moments in which you get some little flavor uh, of a real person speaking and someone understood from the inside instead of just the warrior, uh, the villain and so on. And oddly enough, I think one of those characters is Odysseus in Homer. When Odysseus comes home after 20 years of going around the world uh, and in all his battles and fights and struggles, he comes home and his wife doesn't recognize him. And he's a beard like this, uh, and she has to put him to the test of the famous test of the wedding bed, which he built. And she, he has to say, I know that a vine tree forms part of the structure. Then he goes into a sulk because she didn't recognize him. And she's cross with him because he's now angry with her. And you have a little marital argument, 2,700 years old. So these little moments, they're like little points of light, and I could mention various others, including the essays of Montaigne, where literature given us someone from the inside, and you really come alive with it. But I come back to Hamlet's, the first sustained, really sustained, extraordinary exploration of what it's like to be someone in the real world full of hesitation and doubt. But now, now I think of it, now we're having this conversation about Hamlet. Uh, inevitably, uh, if you have a character full of doubt and uncertainty, you will find it very hard to get off the territory of, of Hamlet. So yes, maybe at the back of, you know, well at the back of my mind is the character uh, of Hamlet. And of course, I wrote another short novel called Nutshell in which it's narrated by Hamlet, um, but he's a fetus about to be reborn. So, yep, he has been on my mind. But I, recently I've been reading Trollope, and um, these are characters formed by society, by gossip, by politics. You don't get them from the inside, but they are magnificently done. And I think the same is true with Dickens' character. The, the impulse to entertain you and give you caricature drives some most of the most extraordinary, wonderful grotesques in, in our literature. I think that character for me has always been a slow build. It has to come from details. And it always takes me back to a lecture that 
uh, Vladimir Nobokov gave in, uh, I think, 1953 to first-year literature students. And he said, you, you, you lot know nothing. I mean, he spoke in a way that um, no lecturer could dare speak now without being cancelled. He said, you guys know nothing. Uh, so you, you're not qualified to talk about themes because you don't know enough about literature. You haven't read enough books. So what I want you to do is fondle the details. And this has stayed with me all my life because I think it's actually what writers do or should do. Uh, we build novels from the sentence up and we love the details. And character and its open quality, has to, it has to blossom. You, know, it, you can't know it all in advance. It has to be discovered, which is why I think that plot is one of the drivers of character um, and vice versa. So, yeah, uh, my head's full of literary characters. I don't think any single one of them really uh, overwhelms me. Um, but I would say that Stephen Dedalus and Hamlet uh, are a kind of background hum, the ground, the air we breathe almost. Any life story uh, that grabs my interest has to have a lack of linearity because I think memory is not linear. And if you walk down the street just lost in your thoughts, I mean, your mind is going all over the place. Quite hard to direct your thoughts. Sometimes what we think about is not under our own control. So um, I think uh, my late friend Martin Amos, one of his finest books was called Experience, in which he brought all the skills of a novelist to write about, about his life. Uh, some of it's about his past, his parents, uh, siblings, and so on. And it had that extraordinary quality of seamlessly moving through life in the way that memory does. Um, not from A to Z, but uh, partly thematically, but even then partly associatively, just randomly. And I certainly try to give that to Roland. Uh, tried to make the novel almost like the act of memory itself. I did keep a journal for a very long time, uh, from about 1974 to about 93. Um, and then for various reasons, some of them quite personal, uh, I abandoned it. Um, and I regret it. But I, every time I regret it and think, well, uh, why not pick it up again? I think it's too late. I've missed out 20 years. Uh, and then the next year, I think I should have done it last year. It was always driven by the sense that most of life we forget. And I just wanted to get it down. Uh, like Roland, um, I felt when I was looking back through them, how annoying it was if I wasted three pages describing a dream. No interest to me 25 years later what I was dreaming. It's just, the banality is what, the, who you were with, who you were seeing, uh, what was said at dinner uh, is so much more interesting than, than also what I wanted to write but hadn't written or castigating myself for wasting time and not writing more or all the things, you know, all the self-criticism is there. It's of no interest to me now. Then my diaries got invaded by others and, um, and they lost their innocence. And I began to think uh, no writer now, especially if you're quite well known, can be writing a diary knowing that uh, sooner or later my archive in Texas will acquire them and they'll be reading. So it's the innocence has gone from the, that business. What I've replaced journals with is um, A4 size notebooks in which I do freely think about work, not about the circumstances of my life. I picked up one of my journals, uh, oh, it was when I was writing the Berlin um, episode, so I thought I'd go and look at my journals. But actually everything I remembered was in the journals, so there was nothing new. But I turned a few more pages and there I'm at dinner and I don't remember a single person. I mean, Fred and Joe, and I, who are these people? <laughs> I didn't, it's not helping me in any way at all. So I don't know, I, I would be more interested in reading Joyce's notebooks about his work um, than what he said to Frank Budgenor, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's all down there anyway. 
I've never got anything back out of them. Really. And that's another reason why it seems to me a waste of time. I don't write to uh, keep my memory fresh. Um, there is, I mean, writers are asked constantly why they write, and it's very hard answered, especially after you've been doing it. I've now in my 53rd year of writing. Now I think if I didn't write, I'd go nuts because I wouldn't have a single reason to exist. Uh, so that there's one underlying reason. But the pleasure of bringing something together is so intense. I mean, I know writers talk, we all talk about the agony of it, but the pleasure of it is just, it's like nothing else. And every now, uh, now and then, um, you hit these moments of just sheer release where you don't exist and time doesn't exist, the place doesn't exist, it's just you and the thing you're doing. And you come around after an hour or two hours, even three hours. Oh, yeah. You remember the rest of your life is back. You hear a dog bark or something brings you back to the world. These are some of the most pleasurable moments, I think, in all human experience. And it's not only to do with writing. It could be a game of tennis. It could be cooking a meal for uh, family or friends uh, or gardening or doing something that requires focus where you become absent. But I think writing is a special case of that because it can be so intense. And those moments I really treasure. These moments don't uh, necessarily occur for any specific common reason. It can, it, it's quite by chance, you suddenly click. You know where you're going, you know what you want to do. You, half an hour before you didn't know, now you know. Solving a difficult problem or two, I think, can for all of us be part of that joy. Once I was researching a novel called Saturday, I had I shadowed a brain surgeon for almost two years. And watching him at work with his team, and it, um, so I'd, I'd be there in my uh, uh, scrubs in the operating theater, just standing a little way back, taking notes, watching this team at work, doing something incredibly difficult, a life is on the line and it's very, very difficult and everyone has to really focus hard. And it's three or four or five hours. And I thought, I want to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> They're getting to that flow moment five times a day, uh, sometimes, you know, 17 hour day of just total, everyone from the, the scrub nurse, uh, the theater nurse, the registrar, young doctors who are just beginning their careers. Um, and I think we, in English, do not have, a, people have suggested flow, but I don't think that quite gets it. It's a joy, but it's not the joy of expansive uh, laughter or ecstasy or uplift in that way. It's a deep satisfaction. And I think that's why people go fishing or learn to sail or handle a kite or, you know, even in their 80s, suddenly take up the piano. That kind of overcoming difficulty uh, in that way is, I think, one of the most pleasurable, deepest moments of um, available to grown-up humans. Well, I think that uh, time in the novel uh, is a bottomless subject. I mean, it's a wonderful subject because I think we've invented a machine, uh, a device, the novel, to investigate time in some ways. It's, it's the perfect machine for it. Um, yes, we know it in movies. You can freeze frame, you can slow motion and so on. But getting as close as you can to subjective states that we all experience, uh, where, for example, I heard a man just come out of prison He'd been there 25 years. He said it went so quick because nothing happened. <laughs> Every day was the same. He says, now it's over. It's just like that. And I hear people talk of, and you'll have this one day, I promise you, you think of your grown-up child's babyhood, and it'll be down to, you know, that. <laughs> All those wakeful nights. You know you had them, but the memory is just a, a dot. I've written, well, I wrote a novel called The Child in Time, which was specifically about how uh, time works for us subjectively. 
anyone who's been in a really panicky emergency situation like a car accident uh, will have extraordinary difficulty measuring the ordinary pace of time against time in 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 those few moments of catastrophe or crisis so um Time as remembered, and of course, this is Proust's great subject, uh, is so mutable. There's a plasticity about time that we can't really catch. Uh, we can't explain it to others uh, unless we write it out so that we can generate experiences within the novel and have the reader experience those same things and have them experience that same weirdness of the mutability, plasticity of, of time, speeding, slowing. Most of life we forget. This is the problem of coming back to journal writing. Um, and what we can't remember are long periods of doing something. New. Um, when I think of my school days, I can isolate a few little pinpoints of time, but I can't really catch the immensity even of the summer holiday. To be nine years old with a six week holiday was like to enter a lifetime. And when you went back to school, it was as if you were just coming onto another planet. Yes, you vaguely remember these things, but now six weeks. And I've always said one of the great, there aren't many good things about getting older. The flight from London to New York used to take hours. Now it's over like this, because as your metabolism slows your subjective awareness of time speeds up. It's one of the great tragedies of aging, actually, is that what you've got left is going so fast, 10 times faster than it went uh, when you were a child. All of this can be caught and analyzed uh, within an evolving lifetime um, of a character in a novel. And that's why I think, will novels die out? No, I think that, you know, uh, much as I love, um, watching long series on televisions and so on, uh, they cannot give you that same unfolded aspect of, of time and its shape-shifting quality. And it will endlessly baffle us, I think. Physics doesn't help. I mean, all um, I've got my mind more or less around relativity. And space-time, which is a very extraordinary basic notion, but still difficult to understand, that space and time should be one thing <laughs> is extraordinary. And we still don't have, we might know that it works, as it were, to think of it that way, but it doesn't really help us. Space is one thing, time is another. Also, to think that time could be bent by gravity, it, again, they seem like two different things. So our explanations at the level of, science will not help us here at all and, and we have to keep on relying on the novel to keep on exploring this well roland writes towards the end of this novel that uh, he, he deeply regrets uh, that he won't know the full story what happens next what happens in the 21st century just to keep it local and he imagines a book of a uh, hundred chapters uh, a chapter for each year uh, and he imagines himself reading this book and what, what hopes he has of this book. Can we get through to the far end of the century without an exchange of nuclear weapons? Uh, will we keep glo the global emergency and the heating to under 1.8, maybe what, maybe two degrees? Um, will we have a major war between America and China? I mean, all those questions. I would love to know. Actually, I'd love to sit down with this book. Um, we're hopeless, us humans, at guessing our own future. It's the future we make collectively. We are so generally wrong about it. No one really, even when the internet was up and running in 2000, did anyone think of the impact social media would have on politics, for example. We were no, yet, yet it was all there. The technology was there or uh, the effect it would have on, on children's sociability or a thousand other things. So um, there are many things to regret about dropping dead, of course. <laughs> um, it's a great privilege to have a consciousness. 
oblivion awaits us, unless you happen to believe in the afterlife. Uh, but people who believe in the afterlife will never discover that they were wrong, because they'll be oblivious. And whereas we who think there isn't an afterlife will be only too pleased to be proved wrong, to find ourselves in some Disney Orlando park for the rest. That's hell, by the way. <laughs> Um, so um, I'd love to stay around I, when people said oh I'd hate to live forever I would love to live forever I'd love to just find out you know, how we're doing in 10,000 years time 